Hi, everybody. Hello, welcome to the library. Thank you for coming out this evening. Um, I'm fighting the urge to grab this mic. Ooh, I just want it right here. Um, <laughs> a few announcements before we get started here. Um, if you are in need of using the restroom, it's out the doors you came in to the right and then hook another right. Um, I always urge folks who come to our events to check out what else is going on at the library this month. On your way out, you'll be able to see our brochure for children and adults. So make sure to grab those to see what else is going on at your library. Um, Liana's presentation will be, include some time for Q&A. So um, I'll be walking around with a microphone that you will have to ask your question into. It's scary at first, but because we're live streaming the event, we have to have you talk in that microphone. Uh, let's see. Um, that's about everything. Without further ado, let's welcome Liana Fink. Thanks, Jacob, and thanks everyone so much for being here. Um, this is a very informal talk, um, so I know, I, could, I think I can ask for this, like if you have a question as I'm talking, ask it. I don't think it'll be live streamed, but I can repeat it, um, and then there will be like a real question time at the end. So, and part of why I ask you to do this is I'm not sure what you want to hear about me. I'm not, uh, this is kind of a pan career talk and I don't give a lot of those. I give a lot of book talks about specific books. So um, I have kind of two career streams. One is little drawings and one is books of drawings, long books of drawings. So I'll be talking a little bit about book cartooning and graphic novels. Um, and I'll try to go, like, go into a medium amount of detail, um, but not enough that would be terribly boring about both. But if you, want, if you are like a nerd about either of these things and you want to hear more detail about pens and things, like that's the kind of thing that I would love to talk about if anyone is interested in hearing. Um, and without trying to be too resume-like, I'll tell you a tiny bit about what, what got me here, um, I grew up in New York State, kind of a little too far to be in the suburbs, and a little bit sheltered. I didn't, I wasn't in a place where there, I went to Hebrew day schools, but there weren't really many art classes, and my mom is, was and is an artist. Before that, she was an architect. Um, so I grew up with this idea of art that was kind of like a family mythology, and I think I had a slightly different feeling about art than I would have had if I'd grown up more exposed to like art classes and other kids who are making art. Um, so I always thought of myself as someone who made art and wanted to make art. I didn't think there was anything dif differentiating fine art from cartoons. So. Um, I think that's part of what got me into cartooning is thinking that that's what art was. Um, so I grew up wanting to be an artist and then when I went to art school I had kind of a rude awakening realizing that what I was doing wasn't really considered to be art. I went to Cooper Union in New York City which is a very kind of Hard to explain it, but it's a very tiny, very idealistic and highbrow and somewhat mean um, institution. Mean in that people are uh, like cultivate the artist persona because it's um, a school of fine art and not applied art. And I feel like fine art needs to be a little bit mean to maintain the mystique. Um, <laughs> and craft was very worshipped there. And I think it, it is just in art in general um, this multi-decade moment. People love like huge and people love like very, um, very crafted and that's not, I'm not, I'm not a sculptor. I'm not someone who can use a glue stick. I can use a glue stick. I'm being self-deprecating, but I did like burn myself terribly in the obligatory welding class that we were supposed to take. Um, and I was always, we, we were really, at the moment, we were very discouraged from representational art. We were supposed to do really go big and go abstract. Um, 
And it's not that I'm like a representational artist who wants to do a portrait, but I wanted to make people laugh and do cartoons. And by the time it was time to leave college, um, I was applying for a Fulbright because the school was really good at getting people grants out of college. And I was trying to think about what kind of amazing fine art project I wanted to make. And I thought I was inventing this new term, which was the graphic novel. And I was like, it's going to be a novel, but it's going to be made of pictures, and it'll be the highest form of high art there is. It'll be like all kinds of oil paint involved and like these like really abstract highbrow stories. And that was the grant application I wrote. And I realized gradually that graphic novel it wasn't a term I invented, and it's not particularly highbrow. It's like a direct com form of communication, and it's in publishing. It's not in the art world. And since I discovered that, and also since I learned Photoshop, which took a long time, I got a lot more comfortable and happy. And I kind of found what I was supposed to be through like reaching backwards behind my head to touch my nose. Um, so that said, I started making graphic novels and also New Yorker cartoons at the same, kind of the same time. And I just desperately wanted both to come true and they came true and it turns out they're not, it's not like life changing to get a cartoon in the New Yorker. It's, it's work, it's freelance work and kind of the same, getting a graphic novel published, you keep doing, it's not a huge life changing thing. You keep doing it and it's meaningful and it's lovely. And I will show you some of, I'll start with the New Yorker cartoons. Um, I'll show you a few cartoons. I'll talk a little bit about cartooning. I'll show you a few more cartoons. So this is one of the early ones that I had in the New Yorker. Um, this is God finds all the prayers of mankind in his spam folder. This was another early one. It's interesting how like unfunny these are now. They were funny at the time, and humor is wonderful and conversational, and it, it's of the moment. Um, <laughs> please type the letters you see above. It, this is also the cartoons of mine that they bought, which were kind of, if there's a Venn diagram between who I am and what the New Yorker wanted. It's, I think it's gotten more, there's been more overlap, but at the time there was very little overlap and I think that these aren't necessarily my best work. Um, Carti highbrow, Cartesian chopped liver, thinking, what am I, chopped liver? General store, we carry items. Yes, we take money. <laughs> And this is an O, trying to hold an O back, and he's saying, Larry, no! Because <laughs> he will, he's not going to win. And then here's a king. I think I've gotten better at drawing kings, but the king is saying, um, moment of silence. The king is saying, they were right. Life did get better after middle school. And this one is called, this one, feel, I feel good about besides the way I drew um, perspective and kitchen appliances, but I feel good about the meaning of this one. It's, it says Alice in Responsibility Land, and all the things in this woman's apartment are saying, are like nagging her to do things with them. So the dripping umbrella is saying, put me away. The door is saying, lock me. Whatever's on the stove is saying, cook me. The muffin's saying, don't eat me. The alcohol's saying, don't drink me. And I made this before I got married and had a dog and kid, a kid, which is shocking. I already felt this way. <laughs> this is the museum. Uh, this isn't funny. The Museum of Art School Portfolios, but I do feel good about how I drew it. Um, I knew there would be a time I could wear them without destroying my feet. <laughs> A centaur taking a shower. 
So to get a little bit nerdy about New Yorker cartoons, um, there's a book that I read when I was first learning how to make them that was really helpful for me. It was by Bob Mankoff, who's the former New Yorker cartoon editor, and it was called The Naked Cartoonist. And it really, like this really is a form, like I, I don't even wanna say an art form, it's like even more, it's more narrow than an art form, it's a subset, it's kind of like a sonnet as opposed to like a poem. Um, the idea of this type of, well, first of all, I call it New Yorker cartoons because the New Yorker is the only place that accepts them anymore. Um, it's really called gag cartoons or single panel cartoons and the internet accepts them as well. But um, there used to be kind of an industry where there were all these different magazines, most in the US, mostly based in New York and the cartoonists would like, I don't know, 40 years ago be, walking from magazine to magazine showing their portfolios and they would start with the New Yorker which paid best but then they would go to all the other magazines and they would make a living that way. And the idea of a gag cartoon is that it's kind of a one-two punch. It's kind of like a Seinfeld joke where you have a setup and a punchline and the setup leaves someone with a question and the punchline answers it in a surprising way. And in this case, the setup, the, the mysterious setup is the image and the punchline is the caption. And you want the reader to see the setup before they see the punchline. And you don't wanna take up too much of your reader's time. I think, I don't remember how many seconds you want them to think about it. It's not zero, but I think it's not 10. I think maybe it's five, maybe it's 10. I think it's five seconds. Um, more than that is too confusing. The older cartoonists used to all go, like, this is a past era, but um, there used to be a whole crowd of like cartoonists in their 80s who would all gather at the New Yorker to show their cartoons on one day a week. And it was very social and they would encourage the younger cartoonists. Everyone was really nice, I think, because there's not a huge amount of money in this field. Um, people are really kind to each other and um, they would give me tips and one of their tips, um, Mark Gerberg told me that you don't want to have any detail in a cartoon that isn't, that's going to distract people from the joke. So um, you get used to scanning a cartoon for things that might that people might think are part of the joke, but that aren't, and you'd wanna get rid of those things. So um, in a, you want a face to not be too complicated, but the part of the face that you want people to see, which maybe is the facial expression or the fact that it's speaking, mouth open, you wanna really make that clear. So it's all about clarity, um, kind of like journalism. So it's interesting being part of the magazine world, like, we belong in the magazine world. Um, she's smart, she's funny, she's beautiful, but she leaves her shoes all over the place. And this is a showcase of how good I am at Keynote, um, which is the program I put this together in, which I just have this internal rebellion against. <laughs> it reminds me of being in fourth grade, like learning to use a computer for the first time, or I don't remember when we had to learn, it was high school, we had to learn PowerPoint and it was not very user friendly. Um, your scheme will never work, I'm the conductor. I don't like how women are portrayed in the constellations. I actually got an angry and thoughtful letter saying that my cartoon was sexist as opposed to a comment on sexism. And I found that interesting. I think about it a lot. I don't know if the person was right, but it made me think. Um, you're stealing the blanket. <laughs> I can't wait to introduce you to all the people I used to be friends with before I started spending all my time with you. So here's a dog catcher and it's chasing a dog. 
I've never actually seen a dog catcher, so I'm, I don't know if that's even, like this is, like accuracy is important and like clarity and one gets more granular thinking about things like that as one makes more and more cartoons. This is an earlier one. So here's the invention of fine art. I can't for the life of me think of a caption for it. I guess I'll just leave it as it is. <laughs> and I was proud to draw this cave person as female because I've read that cave paintings were often made by women. I don't read a lot, so I don't know where I read that and if it was true, <laughs> but I liked it. I listened to a lot of audiobooks. Um, I love a hearty soup. He's got a hammer. One day I'll catch the koi fish that nibbled my left le oh nibbled my left toe was I wrote this caption wrong. My left toe. It's not you, Daniel, it's men. So like as I made more cartoons for the New Yorker and got more comfortable and as they more importantly as they got more and more comfortable with me, I started making them a bit more about my life. So like that Alice in Responsibility Land one, I wouldn't have made that in my first year of cartooning. And this one also was a bit later. Interestingly, I think they're le as they get more autobiographical, they're less funny. Maybe because my life isn't that funny. <laughs> Looks like we have mice. I'm trying out pencil. <laughs> I didn't know you had a minor. This is one I, I really didn't think was funny and they bought it. I, you submit um, 10 cartoons every week and if you're lucky, they buy one. So the New Yorker chooses which one they buy. Three scientists who discovered gravity before Sir Isaac Newton did. <laughs> Who's been nibbling at my kale house? And they're fitness people. God, I look ridiculous. I can't wait to tell everyone back home that I own an island. Um, one arrow pointing cardiology, neurology, analysis, Kansas, and another arrow is pointing towards Oz. So as a cartoonist, I am most fulfilled by the, like the most, like the kind of harder to get jokes because I'm spending a long time on this cartoon. I'm gonna get bored by a really quick joke, but that's always something that like my intuition doesn't work at fi figuring out which are funny because I'm in a very different position from the, the reader. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how I come up with these. Um, I like to take, I like to kind of take an entire day if possible. This is very outdated way of coming up with these because now I have a kid and I don't have an entire day ever. But I used to like to take an entire day kind of like start doodling and the first hour would be terrible. And like, but the point of the first hour of doodling is that like all of my other ob work obligations kind of like loosen their hold on me so I can actually like think about things that don't really matter to my immediate existence. And then the doodles start getting better and, and I start like drawing things that I think might be surprising. And then after a few hours of doodling, I would highlight or circle the ones that I thought had maybe a surprise in them and I would like spend another maybe 10 minutes or 20 minutes on each one trying to tease out what was surprising and then kind of hone it into a joke. And the point of taking a whole day for me was that I always want to rush into actually drawing the thing because I'm very deadline oriented and I never want to be late on a deadline but, but I knew that if I was trying to rush into drawing things. I would draw them. I would draw things that weren't funny. So I wanted to give myself a whole day to let myself decide what was going to be funny before I started drawing. The drawing itself is slow and kind of boring, and you get to listen to podcasts and things while you do it. And and doing that can ta should take maybe two days, but if one is busy. Um, one can crunch it into less time. I, I like to use 
I've always wanted to draw more like people write, so like editing a lot, doing many drafts and editing, and I find that a light box is really good for that. You can draw something very rough on one sheet of paper and then overlay another piece of paper and finesse the details a little more and then maybe do five or 10 different drafts before you have something you feel is clear enough to, to send into an editor. And something I love about Bob Mankoff, who learned this from a long ago cartoonist, James Thurber, I think, and, and maybe some other ones, is that it, the point is not to be beautiful, the point is to be clear. And different people feel differently, but I feel strongly that that's, that's the case with cartooning. And I think that's why I love cartooning. Um, so much, and I'm not a fine artist. And he's saying, I'm downstairs. Juice box. You're not the sleeping beauty I fell in love with. She's awake. <laughs> and this was the first cartoon I sold to the New Yorkers, Slinkies climbing upstairs to spawn. And this one was deeply not, like I didn't find it particularly funny. I think um, I was trying to make a New Yorker cartoon and I succeeded. Holy shoot, a talking snake. Shh, listen, the sound of my voice. Okay, I think this is enough. <laughs> so, when I was starting to make New Yorker cartoons, I wasn't selling a lot of cartoons and it was kind of a desperate feeling. And I decided to start posting things on the internet in order to feel that I was making things that people would see. And I was a little late to Instagram, but Instagram still felt pretty new. Um, and that's how my Instagram cartoons originated and there they, less now, but they, for a long time, were a really important part of my life. They're kind of a running diary. I used to post many every day. And unlike New Yorker cartoons, they weren't designed to be a joke. They were designed for me to kind of, the way people put something into words to better understand it, I would put the thing into a picture. And I, my theory is that while New Yorker cartoons are a one-two punch, these are just a a one punch. So I'll show you some of these. I would go through, depending on what I was figuring out, I would go through um, some different different phases. So a month for a month, I would focus on the feeling of anxiety, and for a month, I would focus on getting over a breakup, and for a month, I would focus on um, where to like where to go when you work, and for a month, I would focus on I don't know what, but this carried me through. Oh, I, I like had a feminist awakening as I was drawing these, partly I think because I was able to like express feelings that I was having that I'd never been able to express before. And then and it also kind of subsided and then I was dealing with pregnancy and having a baby. So there's dating, there's pregnancy, there was having a baby and I, I drew a lot of it. I'm drawing much, or I'm publicizing much less publishing much less now, even though I'm still drawing a lot. And it's a mixture of my feeling very differently about Instagram and, and also my feeling very differently about strangers seeing anything about my life. I think my life felt a bit like a performance when I was living it alone. And now I want to be much more private. I'm also like much less needing that punch and much more needing kind of long threads, and I wish I could describe that better, but I'm feeling much more drawn to longer forms of art and maybe slightly less personal forms of art. But anyway, here are some of my Instagram drawings. So I was trying to diagram for myself what different feelings feel like in your brain. So that's overwhelm, that's mania. Is there a way to make this big? <laughs> I'm finally looking at the large screen. Okay, perfect, thanks. Okay, overwhelm, mania, it's like there's way more in here than out there, and overwhelm is there way, there's way more out there than in here. I stand by that depiction. Obsession, the spiral, depression, shaded, it's all shaded and intense. 
joy, there's a point, a focused point, and it's radiating out. Nostalgia, I think that's an eye looking backwards. Daydream, and at this point, I'm just trying to fill the square. <laughs> Daydream, <laughs> focus, and confusion is a scribble. Um, a familiar face in the crowd. <laughs> I like him because he makes me laugh. Some of these I wish I'd submitted as New Yorker cartoons. I was getting so much validation from Instagram that it almost felt more meaningful to have something be an Instagram cartoon than a New Yorker cartoon. Um, and this one takes a minute. On receiving, processing a disappointment. So the first one is normal, and then the next one is the, the moment of shock and then you slowly, slowly stop being shocked and are just kind of back to normal. And I don't know why I needed to visualize this for myself, but I think this is how it is for me and it was soothing to put it in, into a picture to remind myself that when a bad shock happens, it will become kind of um, digested. And a lot of these, like I was dealing with something really specific in my life and I intentionally found the universal in it. And when I did that, I hoped that that meant I was obscuring the actual oversharey details. And sometimes it was and sometimes it wasn't. This one, I obscured the details very much and it doesn't make so much sense to me anymore. <laughs> the bad is wrestling with the good. Eclipse, it's just a joke. And the idea of home is always running away from you. All the little things congeal into one very big and scary thing. Thinking no, saying yes. <laughs> this is a dating one. He'll compromise. She'll capitulate. <laughs> this is the kind of conversation that is, has become exhausting to me. All the artists, musicians, and writers we've ever heard of. Ah. <laughs> New acquaintance, let's get coffee one day. And then the two options are get coffee or enemies. <laughs> and if you get coffee, the options are coffee again. Um, the one option is that, and then the two options from that are get coffee or enemies. So I've recently under, come to understand that some people like getting coffee. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> Raise your hand if you like getting coffee with people. <laughs> I think like, I live in New York and like, I think I really do like getting coffee once a week with someone, but I don't like feeling obligated to get coffee with everyone I'm friends with regularly because it's a lot. That's it. <laughs> So I, living in New York and loving to draw in cafes, but also hating the aggressive crowds. I made a lot of cartoons about um, people that begin with the word excuse me. I had a book that was a collection of these Instagram cartoons and I called it excuse me. And I think I actually made this one to just pad out that book with a lot of like cartoons um, that begin with excuse me. Excuse me, is anyone sitting here? So that's really a space for one person and three people are trying to squeeze in. Ow, my back. Hey, what are you waiting for? Come join the conversation. Let's throw a party, she said excitedly, forgetting how much she hated hosting. So I love, something that I loved about doing these Instagram cartoons is words and pictures are kind of interchangeable. They're kind of on the same plane. And I think that holds true for comics also, where it's this flattening medium. Um, so words become really a physical, visual object. And pictures are a form of writing. At least I feel that way about comics. A lot of comics artists don't, and they're the ones that make beautiful pictures. But I think of it more like hieroglyphics or something. Uh, jumping on a call. <laughs> can't work. If you can't work, you can't relax. If you can't relax, you can't work. And this meant 
a lot to me to put that into words because it's true for me. Free time and plans, you can't win. And this is a little girl with a bear, and this is a big girl with an old bear that she's been sleeping with since she was a little girl. You're pushing the past up the hill of the future. Makes sense. You just, I'm gonna find, I'm gonna leave this for a minute so I could jump ahead a little bit. I always pad these out um, and I don't wanna show all of them. I'm gonna find some parenting ones. Yeah, let's see. Okay. So this was from, I feel like I had a one-year-old during a particularly vicious, like cold and flu, flu year last year. And um, they, he was sick like two thirds of the time. And when you have a sick little kid, it's horrible because then you can't work and there's kind of, it's different from, it's a lot like being on parental leave with a newborn when you're just consumed with caring for this little baby, but no one has any pity for you or any understanding that you're not actually able to do any of the things that you normally do. So it felt like we were collecting all the diseases, COVID, flu, mystery rash, hand, foot, and mouth, RSV, stomach flu, cold one, cold two, cold three. And just feeling like friends are the piece, I just don't know where to fit it into this really full schedule and life. Did I say anything weird at the playground today? This sure beats taking care of myself. And it is like this kind of feeling of well-being that comes from being too wrapped up in someone else's life to be able to feel any angst. I will civilize you. She's obscured, trying to quell a raging baby with a pacifier. And this is kind of what it feels like. And in my experience, it continues to feel this way even with an older little kid. All the, all the things you used to think about are like crammed into the front of your brain and then the bigger part of your brain is just like, oh my gosh, what is the immediate need at this moment? Like what has been spilled on the floor? What has been peed on? Um, why is the baby wailing? Why does the baby have hives? Do I need to, where is the towel? Oh, and that's it. So there is more. Just doing a little time thing in my brain. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit from a kid's book, first a kid's book that just came out a couple weeks ago, and it's my first kid's book, and then I'll show you a little bit from a book that is not out yet. So this isn't the whole book. The book is called You Broke It, and this was a cartoon I posted on Instagram, not that exact drawing, but that idea was like a mom bird saying to her baby, you broke it, because she, the baby came out of an egg and broke the egg. So this book um, was kind of the idea of my very brilliant editor that it be really speaking to children as opposed to parents. And that was kind of a new one for me because I grew up with these really incredible books um, like William Steig and things like that that spoke mostly to parents and was kind of like for the kid to eavesdrop on. And I think that's a really wonderful form of kid's book also. But this is a different form of kid's book that's newer and I, w I didn't grow up with where you're really like understanding the kid and the kid is feeling seen. So these are things dense parents say to their kid. You broke it. Stop squirming. 
And I've been reading this lately to children, so I'm gonna restrain myself from asking you questions like, well, but what does a worm do? <laughs> You're making a mess, but what does a tornado do? That's what it does. Careful, you'll get wet. So the style of this book, I was consciously trying to make it look the way my Instagram looks, like kind of casual. I drew really small, we blew it up. Um, I think I still, there's something about my Instagrams that because I photograph them, they have kind of a personal look, like you're you're like taking a glimpse of someone's private diary or something. And I, I wish I were a better graphic designer and knew other ways to like get that vibe, but that's what I'm after. And then the bull saying, be gentle, keep your voice down. And this is, we skipped ahead to the very last spread. Keep your hands to yourself. I am just being me. Um, and then I'm going to show you, I put this together kind of as an experiment for a talk I gave a few months ago. I'm, the jury's still out on whether this is how I should give talks, but I'm going to show you more of a crafted keynote, and I'm going to read from a script. So um, this is a grown-up book for people who have babies, and it's a memoir about the first year of a baby's life and the first year of parenthood but it's masquerading as a how-to manual, and people seem to read, I, I definitely did read a lot of how-to books when I was pregnant and planning to have a kid and when I had a newborn, and it's kind of a way to deal with one's anxiety, and a lot of the advice really doesn't need to be taken and just makes you more anxious, but it's also so kind of calming to read these how-to books, like there's a way, there's a way to deal with everything and it usually involves buying things. So this book is called How to Baby. And this, oh, okay. Ooh, this is long. How much time do we have? Okay, that's the cover. I feel good about the cover. Book covers are one of my favorite media, and I'm in awe of them. And one of the reasons I do illustrated books is that I'm just in awe of like the front and back matter of illustrated books. And it's funny because I'm not, I think you need a lot of wisdom and confidence, neither of which I have, to be really good at that. I'm not really good at it. I just, I just really love it, and I felt in this book, like I'm making a bit of progress with the cover covers and front and back matter. So the front, the front matter in this book was a series of ultrasounds. Um, so now I'm gonna start reading to you from my script. If you've gone public with your news, and this is in the tone of like the fake how-to manual. If you've gone public, and um, this is about pregnancy. If you've gone public with your news, you might encounter a range of responses so one response, finally, another response, why? A last response, why you? <laughs> and I'm kind of feeling that as all my friends get pregnant again. <laughs> I'm the bitter one. Um, you need more, um, sorry. You will also get a lot of advice and here's, um, an illustration that's con composed of words, and it is, no one tells you having breastfeeding, caring for a baby is very hard, and that quote is by everyone. Everyone thinks that they are breaking the news to you that it's very hard. I feel like people used to describe this, this stuff as completely easy and blissful, and all the difficulty was hidden, and we've, at least in my social circle, really boomeranged back the opposite way, where I was surprised that having a baby is nice. Like, no one told me. People only told me that it's really hard. The advice will come to you across the great divide. These people know what it's like, don't they? 
Um, so here's the advice coming at you from the Great Divide. You need more than one of everything, car seat, nursing pillow, stroller, et cetera, so you can dismantle and wash one at a time. Like this is a lot of this I had to like try to make it a little less like the advice I was actually given so people wouldn't recognize themselves in it. This is all real advice. You'll need to take off at least a year, to, which there's a, um, really an argument for that being true, but also an argument for that not being true. Two words, night nurse. Just don't have twins, ha ha ha. Don't eat your baby's leftovers. That was like literally the only piece of advice that my mom gave me <laughs> before my, my son was born. And I still do, I eat them. Um, breast is best. You'll never sleep again. Get ready for life as you know it to end. Like this isn't helpful, <laughs> it's not helpful to hear that. My colleague says prenatal leave is a great time to get work done. You won't be able to afford childcare. Thanks. Be a dad, not a mom. <laughs> daycare is the only truly democratic option. I love daycare if anyone's, eh. I mean, the kid is out. You pay a lot. The kid is out for an entire year the first year <laughs> because they're sick, but they have fun. All you need to know is that the diaper ruffles need to face out. Someone, that was someone's advice to me and I still don't really know what, why. You might surprise yourself and want to be a full-time mom. Set boundaries with your parents now, <laughs> as if you haven't been trying all your life. <laughs> Two words, prenatal yoga. Not, and all this advice like is good. Like all of that advice I showed, like I'm making fun of it, but it's all good and it's also all bad. It's like everyone's experience is very unique um, and nuanced. You don't need a wipe weight. Oh, and these are, oh, right. More, there's a little bit more words. The deluge of input will result in your fixating on what new things you need, where to get them, and how to get them up three flights of steps into your increasingly, oh, cluttered apartment. OK. So that was the how-to manual voice. And then here's more illustrations. You don't need a wipe weight, just a wipe warmer. <laughs> All you need are a few burp cloths and a baby tent for the beach. So people will say like they're acting like they're like a really chill parent and like they're training you how to be chill parents and they're like you just need these like couple of essentials and this $400 high chair. <laughs> the most important thing to have is a manual breast pump for the car. You will jump on this advice even though you don't own a car. <laughs> how are you decorating the nursery? Do yourself a favor and buy lots and lots of swaddles. Invest in a really high-end baby nail clipper, trust me. <laughs> and these things are weird. They like play music and they light up and I accidentally like cut off the tip of my baby's finger with one. The snoo works and the snoo is a $2,000 bassinet. <laughs> And, and everyone has, like, it's a, like, all of, none of this also, besides I think the wipe weight is um, reasonable advice. Get this brand of nipple cream. Get this other brand of nipple cream. And um, this is known as nesting. And this is kind of the end of that segment where a, friend, a woman is seeing her friend who's pregnant and asking, rather than do you know if you're having a boy or a girl, which is also a weird question, do you know if you're having an Appa baby or a Duna? And those are stroller brands. Mm -hmm. I think this is enough for now. An, and I'll read more if no one has questions, which is a threat. Does anyone have any questions? I'm oh, sorry, I didn't make it large. Should we do it again large? <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Hi. Thanks for being here. Thanks so um, much. Yeah, I, I deleted Instagram off my phone like six months ago, and um, 
I think I was born in the 80s, so I, I, I think I'm okay without it. But your account was like a bit of a lighthouse, and I was able to share it with my girlfriends, and it was hilarious, so funny. You said you had a book called Excuse Me. Is, is there a place I could see your work? Like, without adding another thing for you to do, but oh, um, that, that isn't on that platform, maybe? that Because that tone, that, like, the way you described kind of that freedom of approach or whatnot, or maybe things I haven't have been able to see there, um, could I find them in another type of collection, or would you recommend that that one, excuse me, book as kind of a way to start? Thank, that's so kind of you. That made me feel so good. So I also have deleted Instagram, and I have someone who's been posting for me. It's a really much less personal feeling. Um, Excuse Me came out, I think, in like 2019 or 2020, so it's older. I have a Substack newsletter that's free where I put 10 cartoons every week. So that's a place. It's my name on Substack. Thank you. Anyone else? I have a question. Um, it's just me. <laughs> uh, are there any graphic novels or cartoonists that you would suggest us to look into or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am so embarrassed to be less like taking in new things. So I'll give you the same answer I would have been giving five years ago, I think. And yeah, I, yeah, not, it's not a taking in moment, but I, my longtime love is Roz Chast. She, her, her really huge book was called Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? And that's a really good way, good place to start. Um, but I love everything she's made. And I started loving her as a New Yorker cartoonist. And she has a great collection of New Yorker, she has many collections of New Yorker cartoons. But one is called Theories of Everything. And it's big. And I really like that one. And she has a new book about dreams that's also really funny and wonderful. Um, and my like, like two kind of my grand grandfathers are Saul Steinberg and William Steig. They're great. I'm reading a lot of William Steig right now because he wrote kids books and um, my kid is really scared of Shrek, which is interesting. <laughs> I think <laughs> it's scary. Um, but he did one really clever one that I keep going back to called CDB, where everything is just written in letters and then illustrated. And Saul Steinberg is just exquisite. He's hard to pin down. Um, he's really elegant. And a comics art, two comics artists I adore are Gabrielle Bell and Walter Scott, who's Canadian. And he has a series called, um, I mean, a series about a character named Wendy. And I, it's kind of like, He's got all these skills that like I don't have. He's like, he loves people and he loves conversations and he loves storylines and he loves drama. And it's just like so like it's miraculous to me. And Gabrielle Bell has makes things online all the time and also has these wonderful collections of books. And the first one I read by hers was called Lucky. And I just fell in love with her. She just like writes about her daily life in a way that's very like quietly hilarious and just pitch perfect. A last one that I love um, is Kyla Roberts and she's also just hilarious and simple and pitch perfect and she's based in Chicago. Thanks. Um, I also love your Instagram feed. And Thanks. Yeah, found it um, very emotionally <laughs> helpful during the pandemic. Um, and I often thought if you, if doing that much work online for free, like spurred your work in other areas, or if it just sometimes felt like it drew off, like it, you used up ideas on Instagram? That's a great question. Thank you. I have really complicated feelings about it. And I'll be honest, um, which maybe I shouldn't be. So one reason 
it felt really good to put things on Instagram is that everything else feels really unstable. Like, it's re it really hurts when you don't sell a cartoon to the New Yorker for a few weeks running and you start to really worry. And when, when book sales aren't good and when no one reads your book, which like is the state of publishing, it's really sad. And something about Instagram when, when I was really active on there just felt really state, like the steadiest of the options, which is really sad um, because it's so not steady or stable. Another way to answer that question is that it was really, it was good for my career in a lot of ways. Um, when I was doing it, I had more time, so time wasn't a scarce resource for me. I somehow had time for everything, although looking back, I think that my book work could have been a lot better if I'd given it more time, but um, I was at a time in my life when hectic was soothing to me and was good, and I liked being really busy. And Instagram was good for my career in that people would see things, I like people with work to give me would see things I posted on Instagram. So I was doing a ton of freelance and and that was really fun. I like doing that. And it's not a thing I wanna be doing a lot of right now. I kind of have less flexibility and I can't pull an all-nighter and I can't um, stretch my brain in as many directions as I could bef when I have a less full life. And also the algorithm and Instagram are different and it wouldn't, I wouldn't be getting the freelance if, even if I were on Instagram all the time anymore. But I feel like I was doing it for, because I loved it. And I feel like I'm, I don't feel the same connection anymore. And it's taken me a few years to like reconcile myself to that not being as huge a part of my life anymore. But it feels honest and I'm glad I'm not forcing it. And things change, but I miss that. I miss that old iteration of in Instagram. It felt really kind of radical that anyone could put things on there and anyone could see it. Quite a while ago, um, I was on campus and they had a uh, New Yorker editor speaking on campus. And a friend of mine was with me, and uh, she asked the editor, is it true that not everybody gets the jokes of the New Yorker? And he said, uh, yes. And then she asked, um, do you ever uh, see a joke one week, and then the next week you don't get it again? <laughs> and he responded, yes, that's true. My question to you is, do you ever resubmit old jokes to the editor, and then get it accepted, and he doesn't recognize the joke? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> and I think everyone does, because I think it's a bit cruel to ask for 10 cartoons and not promise to buy any. <laughs> and um, I think sometimes they even would want to buy more, and they don't, because they wouldn't buy more than one, usually. It's not, they're not saying the other nine are bad. Um, I try to submit new ones like two thirds of the time and the rest of the time I let myself submit old ones. I wait a few years before resubmitting. There's like a large, it's hard to keep records of which ones you've sold because if you resubmit a sold one, that's really embarrassing if they buy it. Was that Bob Mankoff? Was the editor Bob Mankoff? Did he have long gray hair? We have time for maybe about another question or two. Wonderful. Um, so I just read your graphic memoir last week, Passing for Human. Thank you. And I saw your um, note at the beginning that you changed lots of people's names, including your own. And I was curious about your decision to change your own name in the book. I am too. I think that book, I, I didn't know till I'd finished writing it that I was going to sell it as nonfiction rather than as fiction. And I think those, I think of it as kind of myth. And it's similar to the Instagram card. I don't know if I was, I wasn't completely successful at doing this, but what I wanted was to just like pinpoint the universal and let all of the personal facts fall away. And looking back, I way overshared about my family and I had somehow convinced myself that I wasn't. And I 
feel guilty about that. Um, but I wanted the book to have the vibe of being underwater somehow, so I changed my name to Leola, and I gave all the names, like, kind of, like, how you imagine, like, words sounding underwater. I think I'd originally, when I first wrote it, I had my own name not changed, and I, or my own name changed, and everyone else's name is not changed, <laughs> and I think that's because I changed everyone else's personalities more, and I felt like they were just, like, characters, like, playing my family members. I didn't feel like I was actually portraying my family members, but I don't think that was at all clear to anyone but me. Hi. Um, on Wikipedia, I saw that you went to Belgium as a Fulbright scholar. Um, did that trip have any effect on your life, on your cartoons, or on your anxiety, maybe, or anything? Doesn't matter, but I'm curious about it. Um, my husband is Belgian, and um, I also studied there, so I'm curious about um, your observations about Belgium and the US culture, let's say. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I went to Brussels on a Fulbright, and they have a great comics culture, like the guy who made Tintin, Hergé, was working there, and the Smurfs originated there. And it's like a city where people really value comics. I actually would have preferred to do a project on new comics artists. I loved Dominique Goblet, and there's someone named Ivan Alagbe I really love and really loved at the time. And I, I'm not actually sure he's Belgian, but I think I thought he was, maybe he's French. Um, but that was way too obscure. But I just like the indie comics coming out of France and Belgium are astonishingly good. Canada too, I don't know what it is, but um, I think the stakes in the US are too high and comics have to be really polished and I just really love kind of ephemeral personal comics. Um, they're just so creative. So. Yeah, I don't relate that much to Tintin, but I did go, go to Belgium ostensibly to study Tintin, <laughs> and I think that did make me feel a little self-conscious because I'm not polished. Tintin is super polished um, and not very internal, and I'm, I'm kind of the opposite, even though I like Tintin a lot. Um, but it did, it was a year to make comics, and it was the first year that I, the first moment I had when I was like, allowed to be making comics and not doing it kind of secretly and pretending it was fine art or pretending it was like something else. And I think it made me start looking for other comics artists, which is really like the most important thing for me, the community. And I have a lot of thoughts on Belgium. It was like Brussels is such a fun and weird city. It's like all the, there's a lot of different languages. You don't know if someone will speak Dutch or French, and you also don't know if someone's just there because the EU is centered there and they actually speak totally different languages. So it's like that that like pervades Belgium that, or Brussels, that vibe of like a lot of different languages. Any more questions? Probably about one more. Or how about a round of applause? Thank you very much. So fun, thank you all so much.